Kia ora whanau. good evening. Thank you for tuning in to tonight's Sea Week event, which puts the spotlight on marine megafauna. That's the big things that live in the sea. I'm Alison Balance. I'm your MC for tonight. I'm a natural history writer, a broadcaster, a diver. I've been privileged to see sharks and whales and dolphins from on land, from boats, from on the water and from under the water. I suspect many of you have too. Tonight we'll be meeting some of that marine megafauna virtually through the work of three amazing researchers. But first, let's start with a karakia. Tukoa te wairua ki yariri ki nga taumata. Hai arahi i a tātou mahi. Me tā tātou whai i nga tikanga a rātou mā. Ki a māu, ki a ita, ki a kore i a naro, ki a pūpuri, ki a whakamoa, ki a tēnā, tēnā, hui e taiki e. In English that means allow one's spirit to exercise its potential to guide us in our work, as well as in our pursuit of our ancestral traditions. Take hold and preserve it. Ensure it is never lost. Hold fast, secure it, draw together, affirm. Nā mihi and welcome back if you joined us for the last Nā Kōrero webinar. If you're new to this, a very big hello. While we allow time for others to join, we would like to invite you to introduce you introduce yourselves to us in the chat. We love to know where you are tuning in from. You are welcome to put your answers in the chat box, which is accessed via the text bubble icon at the bottom of your screen, and that should bring up the chat panel. It's on the right hand side. Have a look and make sure you know where it is in case you want to say something. A bit of background about Sea Week, Kopapa Moana. It's New Zealand's annual National Week celebrating the sea, Moana, and will take place at the end of next week. It's on from the 5th to the 13th of March. Sea Week's mission is about exciting and inspiring all New Zealanders to renew their connections with the sea, which should explain why Sea Week is hosting this Nā Kōrero webinar series, which is exploring ocean kaitiakitanga in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Now, Kōrero is free and it's designed to foster better communication about various ocean related topics. This webinar series is highlighting the diverse connections and interactions we all have with the sea, reminding us that our daily lives are intertwined with the health of our ocean environment. It's an opportunity for people from all over New Zealand to engage with us, to learn about our impact on the environment and the actions that we can take to safeguard the ocean. We'd like to say a big thanks to our longtime supporters of Sea Week, and in particular, those who've made this webinar series possible. The New Zealand National Commission for UNESCO and the Live Ocean Foundation. Tonight's guest speakers are three New Zealand experts in marine megafauna. Their presentations will reveal how technological advances have increased our understanding of the movement ecology of many wide ranging animals. We'll discover that our marine megafauna is highly mobile. It doesn't recognize human boundaries and that's a huge challenge when it comes to safeguarding them. We'll hear about the importance of collaboration and finding answers to the big questions that can then inform effective global and local conservation management actions. The speakers will each have 15 minutes to present, then we'll take your questions and we aim to wrap things up by 8.30. The session is being recorded so you can come back later and watch again or share it so others can watch later. Now I have the great pleasure of introducing tonight's star-studded lineup. First, we'll hear from Professor Rochelle Constantine, a distinguished marine ecologist and international whale and dolphin researcher. Rochelle is a professor at the University of Auckland Waipapa Tomato Rau. She leads the Southern Ocean Research Partnership International Whaling Commission Humpback Whale Connectivity Program. That was a mouthful. She's also involved in many other initiatives. Rochelle will be followed by Dr. Emma Carroll, who is a Rutherford Discovery Fellow at the University of Auckland, 
Waipapa Taumata Rau. Emma is leader of Team Tohara, an international group of researchers studying the recovery of southern right whales, Tohura, in the context of climate change. And after Emma, we will hear from Clinton Duffy from the Department of Conservation, Te Papa Atafai. He's an experienced scientific diver and doc scientist, and what he doesn't know about sharks is not worth knowing. Clinton's a member of the IUCN Shark Specialist Group, Australia and Oceania. He's a Marine Research Associate at Auckland Museum and a director of the Tyndale Marine Research Charitable Trust and lots more. Now, don't forget, you can send us your questions at any time using the Q&A function, which is also at the bottom of your screen. We'll let the speakers go first, and then we'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible as after the presentations are finished. But feel free to ask the questions any time. OK, let's get the show on the road. We're going to dive into Aotearoa's marine megaverse, an ocean realm where giants roam. Our first guide to this remarkable place and its humpback whales, Paikia, is Rochelle Constantine. Over to you, Rochelle. Kia ora. Nice to see you again, Alison, and nice to see so many names pop up on the chat. Um, people I know, including Emma, my master's student, who, who's taking a break from the last minute madness of editing. <laughs> Hi, Annabelle, hang in there. <laughs> okay, so let's go. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Rochelle Constantine toko ingoa. Um, as I've been introduced, I work at the University of Auckland, Waipapa Tau Matarau, and tonight I'm going to talk to you about the most magnificent humpback whales and work that I've been doing since last century. First started working on them in 1994, and um, it really does just seem like yesterday. And it takes a village to do this work. Um, I've not named all the people, but uh, there are many, many people involved in this work now, in the past, and will be in the future. There's this wonderful saying by Ngāti Kuri, Tere Tohora, Tere Tangata, where there are whales, there are people. And this is very true. People and whales are often drawn to each other um, for different reasons. Um, and there's not many places in the world where you can't find connections and connect, connection stories about people and whales. But these things changed a lot, um, mostly during the 1900s. Whales were hunted for commercial purposes. Over 2 million whales were killed in the southern, southern hemisphere, most of those in the Southern Ocean, some of them around New Zealand waters and Australian waters on their, their migratory path. And of those whales, over 208,000 were humpback whales. And uh, these, the, this just altered everything in the Southern Ocean. We're only just learning what a devastating loss of these whales were to the actual ecosystem function. Um, and so we've been really interested in the recovery of these whales, especially in New Zealand, Aotearoa, where they hold a very special place for, for many New Zealanders. We are people of the sea. And there are many stories when first people settled in New Zealand uh, and, and continuing through to this day, there are very few people who are not moved by the sight of these whales. We came very close to losing them. Our understanding of the, the whales migration paths are, have been fraught with difficulty. So you'll see here, there's some um, letters, uh, the alphabet across the top, D, E, F, and G. So E and F are the parts of the world that are of interest to us, those are Oceania. Um, they're divided up into these stocks. And these are our International Whaling Commission um, designated breeding stocks. They're for management purposes. It was all about managing hunting whales. They were a harvested resource. Um, the, the, the gravitas of this has changed somewhat and the use of these sort of designated breeding areas are, 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 are sort of changing with knowledge. And I'll talk about that to you tonight. And you'll see at the bottom of the screen there are the feeding grounds with uh, areas five and six in particular, um, the areas where it was thought that the whales from those breeding grounds of ENF migrated to. And you'll see those lines, you know, going pretty much sort of straight up and down. And that was our knowledge initially from discovery tagging, which was where whalers would shoot a, um, a metal dart into whales. And 
and uh, when the whale was hunted at some later point, that, that metal dart was, was retrieved from the carcass of the whale and they knew where it had been tagged, very much like we do fish tagging today, only lots more leather tags today. Anyway, the, the, we, we didn't have a lot of understanding of that connectivity between the, the breeding grounds and feeding grounds. But with, with research over the last few um, decades, um, mostly led by the South Pacific Whale Research Consortium, we know that the, the recovery of these stocks is not equal. In East Australia, the, the whales are fully recovered. There's up around 30,000 of them. Whereas in Oceania, the whales are still only at about 50% of their pre-whaling numbers, despite similar levels of hunting. And we've always been curious as to, to why that is. So I um, you know, took on the challenge, I guess, with my colleagues from the consortium. We knew a lot about them in their Oceania breeding grounds in the tropics because they were relatively speaking accessible. Um, we knew less about them in the Southern Ocean because that is quite inaccessible. And we know really that the whales spend most of their time somewhere between the tropics and the Southern Ocean. And if we were going to work out why they weren't recovering, we thought it might have something to do with their feeding grounds in the South. So we went south. In 2010, we undertook a, a, a dedicated um, whale research voyage under the auspices of the Southern Ocean Research Partnership, the program that, that I now lead. And here we are in the Southern Ocean. You could be literally anywhere. <laughs> you could be off the Chatham Rise. <laughs> it's cold. It's grey. It's not very... Um, it's not very really glamorous whale research in the Southern Ocean. When I say I've been to Antarctica, I have no, no beautiful photos of, of penguins and things. This is mostly what it looks like. It's cold, it's very hard to work there, but there are a lot of whales. The thing is that the ocean in between was, is the, the missing part, and that's where technology came into play. So when we were there in 2010, we deployed some satellite tags. You can see the satellite tag in the, the top, um, top uh, left of the picture uh, covered in its, its sheathed um, protective um, casing. And then in the bottom on, uh, is the biopsy rifle where we take a small skin sample of the whale and these are two humpback whales. So we, ta we tagged and biopsied and photo identified a lot of whales. And you can see here on that expedition, you can see in that blue circle, we sort of covered the area from about 150 east to 150 west in Antarctica. And we traversed that area extensively. Almost all of the whales we found were at the Bellany Islands, the humpback whales. We identified 112 individuals, either genetically shown by the, the dotted lines or um, by a photograph of the underside of their tail shown by the solid line. And you can see that almost all of those whales matched to East Australia. There was one connection to Cook Strait and one to New Caledonia. I was pretty disappointed, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I was really hoping to find um, the Oceania whales down there. And if you remember those lines, it sort of went roughly straight up and down. At least some of the whales should have been there, but we only got the one to New Caledonia. So given that going down to Antarctica costs a lot of money, that voyage in 2010 was over $3 million. And we don't have that kind of money, mostly in research. So instead, I went to Roll Island. And Roll Island, or Rangitahua, is at the Kermadex group at the northernmost part of New Zealand. But it's a place where the whales are migrating south from their Oceania breeding grounds. And if you look at a map, there's basically nothing <laughs> as, you, as you go east. There's virtually no land mass in the way until you hit South America. So Roll was kind of our main possibility. So given we found just East Australians and a couple of New Caledonians, we didn't need to go south again. Instead, we went to, um, we went to roll. We took small tissue biopsy samples, and you can see at the end of my um, small uh, dart tip there, and the underside of the flukes. And we worked out that the whales coming through Roll Island are migrating from a, an expanse of about 3,600 kilometres of um, breeding ground. And they were coming through Roll Island. We then deployed our satellite tags. Here's Simon Childerhouse from Cawthron deploying a tag. And the whale swims away with this very small dart in it. Those tags uh, continue to go for up to eight months. So this is a small graphic where we tag the whales here at the top, got New Zealand. This light gray is a rough approximation of the ice edge and the bright white is the Antarctic continent. So I'll play this for you. So the whales were tagged, we tagged 24 whales. Um, in the late September, early October of 2015, 
The pink ones are girls, the blue ones are boys. The green ones, we didn't get a sample to know their sex ID. You'll see that on the left side, there are females with little calves underneath them. You'll notice that all of those females with calves, there are four that females that were tagged, basically headed straight down. Um, the other whales, males and females without calves, they headed much further to the east, over towards the Bellingshausen and Ammons and Sea. So you can see now this is late June, the ice has receded, but the whales moved down closer to the ice edge in that Ammons and Bellingshausen region. Whereas the mums with the calves actually stayed considerably further north and um, our PhD student, Lena Rekula, um, showed that there's very different habitat use and distance from um, ice edge by these whales. So mothers and calves have very different use um, and migration patterns to animals without calves. So this is the track in static form. The whales traveled, well, the closest was, was Tonga, which is about 900, 900 kilometers away. And in a straight line from Roll to the Amundsen Sea, it's about 8,200 kilometers. An estimation of their total migration from breeding ground to feeding ground and return is around 18,000 kilometers. And in fact, for one of the whales, it was over 25,000 kilometers. This is where the mother calf pairs went, a very different place. And when we look back on the historical whaling records that held true, these whales, mothers and calves use the space differently to animals without calves. So they have a different and much shorter migration path. So when we were at Roll Island, we were very mindful that the whales coming from the Oceania breeding grounds and that sort of from about September, October is usually the peak. We also have, down on the west coast of the South Island in the Fiordland area, we have another migration going on. So there is another wave of our southern, southern migrating whales. And you can see here from this work by, uh, led by Jen Andrews Goff, who's a wonderful collaborator from the Australian Antarctic Division, she mapped these um, tags, which we'll look at in a little bit more detail. And you can see from here that they are coming from East Australia. We also, um, a student of mine, uh, Victoria Warren, published her work looking at listening to the acoustics of whales migrating past New Zealand and found a very similar pattern. So we have a long-term um, working relationship with, with Dock and Fiordland. Since 2017, um, they've been going down to the fjords area. This is a, a map of our path. You can see on the left side from our 2017. And we go in and out of all the fjords and looking for humpback whales. Um, you can see it's a little bit frosty down there sometimes. Sometimes it's sunny, sometimes it's snowy. It's a very different place to Roll Island. But what we know is that there are a number of humpbacks and we have been taking fluke ID photos and genetic samples. And what we're finding, maps and mirrors, what we're finding with the, um, with the, the humpbacks uh, that were tagged in Australia. So this is the original tags. And this is Jin's work looking at it in more detail. The red dots are where the whales are stopping. We call it area restricted search. So it means they're staying in a place and looking for food. And we know that these whales are feeding off and in and around the Fiordland area. So they're getting some snacks on the way. The whales migrating from Raoul don't snack. They just go all the way south. So maybe they're not getting as much food. We're not really sure, but it'll be something to look to. Uh, in the future. So we're finding the same results with satellite tags, with genetics, with photo ID, that these whales are, um, are, are, are East Australian whales with the occasional New Caledonian whale as well thrown in there for good measure. So the project that I lead for the International Whaling Commission is um, getting a big picture of Southern Ocean humpbacks. So this first image here is from 1928 to 1973 from the IWC of whaling. This is where they killed whales. In 1978 to 2010, the International Whaling Commission undertook designated surveys um, in various parts of Antarctica. And you can see here, despite being protected since the mid-1960s, the whales are coming back very slowly compared to the whaling era. We've now uh, taken um, all of these uh, tag data that we have. It's a big um, international collaborative project and I'm hugely grateful for all the partners. The analysis is led by the wonderful Ryan Reisinger from Southampton University. There's 11 research projects contributed um, and contributed tracks, 378 satellite tracks of humpbacks over a 17 year period. So you can see it's unusual looking at the world from an Antarctic perspective, but you can see the Atlantic 
Ocean, East Indian, West Pacific, Central Pacific, which are the purple are our tags, and East Pacific tags. And these represent different stocks of whales. And so we're looking at real big differences in where the foraging habitat are. And we're now working on modeling climate change scenarios for how these stocks are recovering in the different speeds. And you can see from the tags that orange and yellows are when the whales are really moving quite quickly and very directional. And then the sort of purpley colours, pinky colours are where they're stopping to feed. So it's quite different to what we see off Fiordland where they stop to feed. Moving forward, well, our, um, all of our tag data have just recently been included in a big analysis of humpback. Um, right whales, grey whales, uh, North Atlantic and so southern right whales. Uh, there's all kinds of different species. I think there's fin whales and there's blue whales, all these tagged animals, looking at these um, migratory corridors, these sort of highways, these places that are important to the whales. What we know is technology is taking us to these inaccessible places. Getting to Antarctica is very hard, and even if you can, it's hard to find whales or anything, actually. What we see today isn't normal. So for these depleted and recovering populations, such as humpback whales that were hunted extensively, what we thought was normal 50 years ago, 20 years ago, and even today isn't. And these whales are, are revealing themselves in interesting ways of where are their favoured spaces. And telemetry then allows us to understand where those important places are, especially for things like protected area design. Collaboration is key. There's no time for empire building. There's no time for holding on to your data. It's not going to help you. It's not going to help the animals, most importantly. And it's not going to help managers make important decisions to protect these animals into the future, because there are other emerging threats for them now, such as ship strike and entanglement in gear. Integrating knowledge types, so the genetics, um, the photo ID, tagging, and there's a whole bunch of different things. Emma and Clinton will talk a little bit about some of their examples equals a much better and more inclusive and effective conservation outcomes. And also incorporating indigenous knowledge is really critical, especially for these important species. I'd like to thank all of the people who've supported this work, um, in particular Ngāti Kuri and Te Aupuri who let us work on their, their taonga um, and, and all of the research partners. And I'll just um, finish with you know, this message. This is, um, this is at Roll Island, a mother and a calf, and these whales are flipping around and they're happy. They don't know they were almost made extinct. And the future of these kinds of animals lies very much in our hands. We need to get out of the way and we need to let them recover. Um, and, and they will. Yeah. Kia ora, thank you for listening. Kia ora, thank you, Rochelle. That was fascinating. Next up, our exploration of the ocean deep leads us to Tohora or Southern Right Whales. And our guide is Emma Carroll. Take it away, Emma. Thank you, Alison. Mm -hmm. Hi, kia ora koutou. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name's Emma Carroll. I'm, um, as introduced, I'm from the University of Auckland, Waikapa Tamatarau. Uh, and it's really exciting to be here and talking to you about our work on Tohora or Southern Right Whales. Um, so Tohora are uh, known as Southern Right Whales um, because uh, they were really the right whales to hunt. These are really large animals up to 18 meters and 80 tons. They are slow swimming um, and they float when dead. And so they were called the right whales to hunt by whalers who really Saw, saw them as like an ideal target. We're talking about early whalers here. So, you know, um, people in, in rowboats and handheld harpoons. Um, and these early whalers were uh, quite um, successful in New Zealand in terms of, of their industrialness, you know. Historically, we estimate there are up to 30,000 southern right whales throughout New Zealand's waters. And we could find them in the winter months around the bays and inlets of um, mainland Aotearoa and during the summer months it actually moved north and east um, to feed and so this whole migratory cycle was thought to actually occur within our waters. So they were also found down in the southern Antarctic, Auckland Island or Makahoka and Campbell Island or Moto Ihutupuku um, but we're not really sure if that was historically a breeding ground or a feeding ground. However, between 1790 and 1980, over 35,000 southern right whales were killed in New Zealand waters. And that's dramatically changed where we see 
Tohora today. So around the mainland, which used to be this really key wintering ground where they would breed and socialize, we only see a handful of sightings each year. And we really see large aggregations only uh, in the subantarctic Auckland and Campbell Islands during the winter months. And so one of the, the key questions that we ask as scientists, given that this is a pattern we see around the world in southern right whales and other humpbacks, why has this changed so much? And why do the whales visit particular areas, but not others? And so part of the answer we think is due to social learning. So quite simply, social learning is learning something from someone else. And social learning has been demonstrated in a wide range of animal species, from insects to primates to whales and dolphins. So for example, bees uh, will do a little dance in their hive to show each other where to find a good feed. New Caledonian crows, as the one shown here on the right, they will actually uh, build tools to hook grubs and other insects out of tree cavities. And they learn how to do this by seeing the tools of others and then copying them. So social learning can lead to traditions where different groups of animals will have different behaviors that are passed down through the generations. Uh, these behavioral traditions are also called culture. So many scientists view behavioral traditions or culture as being on a continuum from human complex traditions uh, that we have um, down to very simple ones like we see in animals. So when we think about social learning and culture in southern right whales, I really like to, to think about the idea that mother knows best. So these are amazing um, animals when it comes to looking after their young. And this is a, a wonderful photo taken in the Auckland Islands of a mum southern right whale and her very curious calf. And these whales will only have one baby every three years. And she loses about 25% of her body volume while nursing. And that's because on her winter breeding grounds and winter calving grounds, she won't eat. So she has to eat all of the food that will last her as well as uh, her calf in those summer feeding grounds. And, you know, she's such a good mum that she wants to make sure that her calf knows where to go to feed and breed as well. And so that calf will be born in her, their mother's favourite wintering ground and will travel with her to her favourite offshore feeding grounds in summer. And that way, the calf learns its mother's favourite migratory destinations in its first year of life. So in this way, you end up with different groups of females uh, passing on those particular traditions or migratory traditions um, to their offspring. Um, and we call this migratory culture. So it's just different groups of whales learning different migratory traditions that will then slightly change over time. And just a quick note on culture here. Uh, this type of migratory culture is thought to be quite common in southern right whales and humpback whales. But we have even more complex behaviours in other whale and dolphin species. So for example, uh, uh, killer whales and sperm whales have what are called ecotypes or clans. And these are different groups of these whales that might specialise on eating a particular type of food. So with killer whales, you have animals that specialise on eating fish or other marine mammals. Um, or they might have specific uh, communication methods or dialects that mean that the different groups can behave or use their environment quite differently. Um, so getting back to that question about why uh, our whales are using New Zealand's ocean in a very different way now to historically. So to be able to understand this, we first need to find these whales. Um, and that means going down into the Auckland Islands or Mocha Uh This is a really amazing place. Uh, it's about 500 kilometers south of the South Island. Um, and we go there in winter. Um, and unlike the, the whales, we, uh, we do mind the weather. And the weather down there is quite extreme. We often encounter snow 
as you can see in this first picture, and extreme wind and rain, as you can see in the bottom. Um, this is a, a really amazing place to visit, uh, even, even though it has a very challenging environment to work in. And that's because it's a World Heritage Site. Uh, it's an uninhabited archipelago, so it's really one of the most wild places left in the world. Um, and, you know, we go there because the whales are there. Um, and so, enabled to be able to, excuse me, in order to study them, we're actually bringing to bear these kind of technologies that Rochelle's been talking about. So we're doing satellite tracking of the tohora, and we're also taking skin biopsy samples to look at the genomics of these whales. And so um, the skin biopsy samples are actually incredibly informative these days. There's so many different techniques and, and technologies that have been developed that are, will allow us to use genomics, not just to um, identify individual whales, but also their kin, and even to estimate their age from their DNA. But today I'm just gonna talk about um, their maternal lineages that we understand from their genomics. Uh, and what that means in this context of migratory culture. So the satellite tracking work is really uh, unveiling amazing insights into the whale, the lives of these whales. So, you know, we protect them um, well during those three months of the year that they're in the Auckland Islands, they're protected by a marine protected area and a marine mammal sanctuary. But then the other nine months of the year, we haven't been sure where they're going. Um, and satellite tracking is actually allowing us to understand this. And so what you're seeing now is essentially a year in the life of Wurramu or Bill the Whale. So we tagged uh, Wurramu in August 2020, uh, and he undertook the longest uh, journey of any southern right whale tagged uh, to date. It's about 15,000 kilometers round trip. He went about halfway to South Africa and back and he visited several different foraging grounds. So over here, uh, he seemed to forage south of Australia, as well as to the west here. And then he tracked along uh, the Antarctic coast and did seem to stop and feed as well. Um, and they, he did all that before looping back to the Auckland Islands. And so this whale uh, really produced this amazing insight in, and has really increased our knowledge about how far these whales can actually travel and the fact that they're visiting multiple foraging grounds in one, in one season. And I guess you can see that it's quite a different pattern to the humpback whales that are traveling south to feed along the ice edge. Southern right whales can feed um, from about 30 degrees south all the way to their ice edge. So they're really um, traversing the whole of the southern hemisphere. And so moving on from just Bill, um, what we can see here is the satellite tracks of all 17 whales that we have tagged at the Auckland Islands over the past two winters. Uh, and I think, you know, each colour is a different whale, but I think what you can get from the overall picture is they all seem to be this initial southwest and then uh, northwest movement. And you can see Bill's extended track here in yellow. So they're all going west and they does seem to be a bit of a hotspot where they're feeding south of Australia. Um, and you can actually follow their voyages at this, um, at this website, www.tohoravoyages.ac.nz. Um, but the important thing here that I want to highlight is um, they are going in the opposite direction to where the historical whaling catches for New Zealand right whales were. So all of the historical catches were to the north and east of New Zealand. Uh, during the spring and summer months. Um, and in comparison now, the tracked whales from the population are going west. And so this is quite a dramatic change. Uh, the only thing I'd like to highlight is we have one whale here. This is Takao Maurua. Uh, this whale is actually still transmitting. Um, he was tagged in July. And this whale is actually tracking towards where these historical whaling grounds were. But overall, uh, it's a very... Um, different pattern to what we expected based on historical data. So what we see is using these satellite track data, we can actually see there's been a dramatic change in movement patterns of these whales over time. The other way that we're investigating how this whale's culture has changed over time is by looking at the maternal lineages in the population today compared with historically. 
So if you remember, those migratory traditions are passed from mother to offspring. And the genetics um, actually allows us to track those maternal lineages by using a genetic marker that is maternally inherited from mother to calf, like those behaviors. What this uh, graph shows here are the frequencies of these different maternal lineages um, with the contemporary population shown in blue. And so the size of the circle indicates how common that maternal lineage is in the population. And they're linked depending on how similar they are. In green, we have maternal lineages that were found in historical whale bones from around New Zealand. And I think what you can see is the most striking thing is that there's not many uh, maternal lineages that are both green and blue. In fact, there's only one. This haplotype here, or sorry, this maternal lineage here is the only one that's found in both the current population sample and the historical sample. And that's actually quite a common maternal lineage. It's found in almost all of the different southern right whale populations around the world. And so what this is telling us is that not only are the behaviors changed over time, but those maternal lineages or those um, behavioral traditions uh, are actually changing that we can see in the genetics. And so I think combined, and this is an example here of um, combining the different uh, different data types to really get a, a critical oversight of uh, what's going on with these whales shows us that there's been substantial changes, not just in the abundance and distribution of these whales, but in their um, migratory traditions. And we suspect that's because the whales that used to inhabit mainland New Zealand, the ones that would visit Aotearoa to carve and give birth around places like Akaroa and Kapiti, they've probably been uh, wiped out essentially. And so when you, and, and that's why we don't see many of those maternal lineages in the current population. And when you wipe out whales that have knowledge of, of these regions as a good place to carve, um, they can't, they, you, you lose that knowledge in the whole population as, as, a, as, those, as a good place to visit. And so when you lose these maternal lineages, you lose those behaviors. And that's why we think we don't see many of the whales going to those eastern areas. And so I think it's important to think not just about the numbers and uh, the change in numbers and distribution, but what it means for the behavior and culture of these whales um, that we've played such an important part in, in shaping how their populations have changed as well. Um, and as the populations recover, you know, they're potentially going to recover in a quite a different pattern to what we saw them historically. And so I think it's also interesting to think about not just how those whales cultures have changed over time, but how our cultural perspective on these whales has changed so much in the past 200 years. And thinking forward, if we want the whales to come back and start using um, Aotearoa, you know, the mainland area as a uh, migratory destination, as a wintering ground, we have to make sure we leave some space for them. Uh, so, um, and with that, I'm going to thank um, all of my collaborators. I, I have uh, an amazing team um, of people from all around the world who have contributed time, energy, and and effort into this project. It really takes a village to put one of these projects together. I'd also I'd like to thank my um, funders uh, who have contributed generously towards this work as uh, it's very difficult and expensive to get to places like the Auckland Islands. Uh, and again, I'll just highlight if you wanna follow our, the voyages of our tohara, um, please visit the website. It's publicly available and you can see all of the tracks there. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you, Emma. Fascinating again. And now we leave air breathing marine megafauna and dive into the world of sharks with Clinton Duffy. Over to you, Clinton. Stand by, people.
I'll unmute myself. Oh, kia ora, everybody. Um, I am going to talk to you about um, a group of it, animals that, um, unlike whales and dolphins, don't stick their heads out of the water very often, which makes them rather challenging to study. Um, I'm going to speak mainly about two species of sharks that I've been lucky enough to work on, largely in collaboration with uh, Dr. Malcolm Francis, formerly of NIWA. Um, and we're going, we've already heard um, quite a lot about why it's important to understand the movements of whales. Uh, I'm just going to touch briefly on why it's important to understand the movements of sharks and rays, um, particularly protected species. Um, sharks and rays as a group are quite vulnerable to um, overfishing or to, to fishing pressure because of um, aspects of their reproductive biology. They're typically slow growing, uh, late maturing females often mature at um, around about half their maximum age, and they don't. And most of the larger species don't um, breed every single year. So, what, um, so it's absolutely crucial to understand how their populations are structured, uh, what um, their connections to other parts of the globe are, um, identify their critical habitats, um, so we can identify areas where um, you know. Uh, activities other than fishing uh, may be impacting their survival. Um, looking at the timing of shifts between um, juvenile and adult habitats and um, quite importantly um, uh, need an ability to incorporate um, estimates of immigration and immigration into stock, into stock assessments. And um, uh, Ultimately, um, much of this information uh, feeds into assessments of uh, risk, and, uh, particularly with overlap with commercial fishing. It's one of the major um, impacts on sharks and rays globally. So um, the tools we use um, to study the movements of sharks and rays are very similar to the tools used to study uh, cetaceans. Um, uh, genetics is a, is, a, is a very, very important tool. It, it allows us to not only estimate um, or, or reconstruct the population structure, but it's more recently being used to estimate um, population sizes. Um, in um, particularly, uh, the most recent example of that is the estimate estimation of the size of the Australian and New Zealand white shark populations. Um, stable isotopes um, in the shark's tissues can tell you about um, where they grew up. Uh, the, or, or their favourite feeding um, uh, um, habitats as adults. Um, then there's the conventional streamer tags, which some of you may be familiar with. They're little plastic or um, um, streamer or spaghetti tags. They're just um, they're numbered. Usually have the um, address of the uh, of the tagging institution. They're injected into the, under the skin, um, usually in the back of the animal by a fin or something, and the animal's sent off. Into, uh, into the wild again, and you don't hear about them uh, until the animal individuals are recaptured. And so it gives you a, a so you know a, a release point and a recapture point. Sorry, Clinton, um, can you share your screen? We can't see your presentation. I am sharing my screen. Sorry about that. Can you see that? No. Oh, it was working before. Uh, is that better? Yes. All right. I just need to put it into presentation mode. I apologize for that. Um, I can't actually. Can't actually. All right, I'm very sorry about that. I, I thought that. Um, can you hear me? It says I need to unmute myself. No, you're good. Oh, that's strange. Okay. All right. Um, so, with the conventional stream or spaghetti tags, 
we um, we get a we, we know the release point and we know the recapture point. We don't know very much about what the sharks um, done in the in between. Um, if we're lucky, we'll get um, information on their growth rates. Um, and another um, method that's particularly useful on on species that have distinctive um, color patterns, like whale sharks and great whites, leopard sharks, are there um, is um, individual photo identification. That can give you information on their movements if the animals are recited elsewhere. But it's mainly um, it's it's most of, most useful for um, developing population estimates. The big advance in understanding the move movements of sharks and rays has been a development of a whole range of, of electronic tags. Um, most Possibly the most widely used are acoustic tags, which send out a coded acoustic ping through the water and are detected on receivers, such as the one that you can see the, by the nose of that tiger shark. Um, that'll give you um, information on um, the, the, uh, the animal's movements within it the array of receivers. And if you're lucky, you'll get them moving into the arrays of other researchers and they'll they'll contact you and tell you they've had one of your animals swimming through their array. There's also been a development um, called um, chat tags that uh, where that allows tags on different animals to talk to each other if when they come into contact and share that information um, with the researchers. There's been a variety of satellite tags developed. Um, the commonly used ones are pop-up archival tags. These are tags that um, archive information on depth, temperature, and, um, and light levels, date and time, all that sort of stuff. That allows you to reconstruct the tracks of the animals. And um, there's a variety of fin-mounted tags or toad tags um, that uh, give you fine scale, generally give you fine scale information on the movements of the sharks. And more recently, there's been a whole um, development of group of, of clamp-on tags uh, that include instrument packages that, like such as acceler or accelerometers and clinometers, and cameras. Um, and because these are expensive um, and people want to get them back, they're generally used to study very short-term movements of the animals, so over the orders of hours or maybe one or two days. Um, so most of the work that I've that um, I've been involved in on Marco sharks and great white sharks um, has involved the use of satellite tags um, and acoustic tags. So we've used um, because no one tag type gives you all the information that you um, that you're really after. You need to often need to use a combination of them. Sometimes on the same animal, more commonly on a lot of different animals. Um, the, the first there on the left are the pop-up archival transmitting tags. They're about the size of a handheld microphone. They have a float on the one end, and after a predetermined pre um, length of time, uh, the pin at the bottom of the tag burns through and releases the tag from the tether and it floats up to the surface and transmit, transmits the stored data um, to an um, Argos satellite, and, and that either emails you or, or, or drops the um, data into a into a web portal. The um, bolt-on tags, the spot tags, um, they're usually attached to the first dorsal fin of the shark. Uh, they transmit every time the shark um, uh, lifts its fin out of the water. And um, they give you very generally fairly good information, fine, fine scale information on, on the shark's movements. Um, but you don't tend to get as much information on depth. Uh, the diving behavior of the animals. And on the right are the acoustic tags. Um, in New Zealand, we primarily use the external, um, um, them externally, uh, they're attached to the outside of the shark, much the same way as the pop-off tags using a, a short tether and a dart. And um, as I sort of said before, they really need to be within, within a few hundred meters of a receiver. So you can either follow them, follow the sharks actively using a hydrophone, um, there have been some recent use of um, autonomous underwater vehicles to follow acoustically tagged great white sharks. That's generally short term, only in the matter of um, you're only able to follow individual sharks in a matter of hours. And um, your auto autonomous underwater vehicle is also subject to attack by, 
play great white sharks. They're quite, it's quite an invasive method. Um, so if we look at um, where we've um, satellite tagged great white sharks in New Zealand, um, our primary um, study sites were at the Chatham Islands in the Stewart Island, two places that were really um, already well known for or sort of, there was a lot of folklore in both places about the white sharks there. Um, and um, um, when we started in about um, 2004, 2005, there wasn't a lot known about white sharks. The common, commonly held belief was that the white sharks we had in New Zealand were vagrants from Australia. Um, these Aussie sharks coming over here to molest and scare New Zealanders. Um, and um, they were basically considered um, visitors. They weren't considered resident here at all. Well, the first thing we found out when we began um, tagging sharks, um, uh, the great great whites at the, at the Chathams uh, in particular, is that they're spending uh, months here. Um, they're uh, both places, Stewart Island and the Chathams, they were concentrated around um, seal colonies, pretty classic, um, classic, um, classic places to find great white sharks. And um, we expected to see a lot of movement between Australia, particularly Southern Australia, where there's a large white shark population known. Um, uh, but what we actually saw was, a, was that um, starting from about um, April through to, uh, in, in April, May, running through to about um, August and September, the sharks started leaving New Zealand and heading north. Um, up into the subtropics and tropics. Uh, it was completely unexpected. Uh, we, as I said, we expected to see more movement to Australia and particularly Southern Australia. Um, and the other thing um, to note is that we, have, as yet, we haven't seen any movement of sharks between the Chatham Islands and, and Stewart Island. So if the sharks from those, those two aggregation sites are mixing anywhere, it's up in the tropical Pacific and along the east coast of Australia. The other thing we uh, observed, both using um, this, the satellite tags, but also importantly photo identification, it allowed us to identify sharks that were returning to the study site year after year after they'd lost their tags. So this is an example of a turn, return um, of, of two migrations from, from Stuart Island by a, a large female great white. Um, called Ella. Um, as you can see, on, on both uh, in both years, um, she uh, she left Stewart Island and um, visited uh, a place called the uh, Bologna Plateau uh, in the Chesterfield Islands in the in the Coral Sea, and then returned um, at a very similar time of year um, to to Stewart Island. And often the sharks that we were studying at Stewart Island would see them within a week or two of having seen them the year before in almost exactly the same places. So they're extremely good navigators and they're able to find their way across uh, thousands of kilometers of ocean um, uh, um, quite well. They're doing these 3,000, you know, one of these outbound journeys is about 3,000 kilometers and they're doing it in about 20, 22 to 25 days. If we look at um, the data we get from spot tags, these dorsal fin mounted tags, gives us a lot of a lot more fine scale information. Um, this is a track of a, a juvenile, about a 2.1 meter great white shark that was tagged in Kaipara Harbor, not far from Shelley Beach. Um, unfortunately, what we've discovered um, with the white sharks is that um, when they're on their foraging grounds, they don't spend a lot of time swimming around on the surface, sticking their dorsal fins out of the water. So where I was hoping to get nice, um, nice information on the use of the harbors, um, I got nothing. Once the, once they're in the harbor, they stay close to they appear to stay close to the bottom. They don't stick their fins out. But when they leave the harbor, we get these really great tracks um, that show. Um, uh, uh, quite a lot of use on the inner shelf, especially around the entrance to the harbour. And that turn, turns out, I'm talking to commercial fishermen, that turns out to be a really good place to find trevally. Um, so they're at, at this size, um, great white sharks are primarily fish eaters. So they're eating things like trevally and snapper, kahawai. And we see it makes this long movement um, down the um, upper slope, um, get, diving down to 600 metres at times. 
before popping into the Waikato River mouth. Um, I won't mention now the dolphins, but and then and then um, this shark actually swam straight back to the Kuiper and right back to the place that we tagged it from. So what we the the what we saw in these juveniles from the Kaipara and a few that we managed to tag in the Manukau as well, is they would they would leave the harbours, make quite long journeys up and down the, um, the coast, but the sharks from the Kaipara harbour returned to the Kaipara harbour. And they, they'd even swim past um, you know, other harbours that we knew, know had great whites in them, like the Manukau, but they'll go straight past the entry and go back into the Kaipara harbour. So these juveniles, um, they've obviously found somewhere good to feed, um, they remember that, and they're making seem to be making these long forays backwards and forwards from from the harbors, um, learning, I guess, developing traditions. Um, this is the other species we've looked at, and this is um, work that um, Malcolm Francis um, spent quite a bit of time on. This is a marker shark, a very close relative to the great white shark, but much more oceanic species than the great white. Um, they don't spend anywhere near as much time um, hanging out around reefs and whatnot. Um, it's a species considered to be highly migratory and um, in the past sort of been implied that they just float around the ocean rather aimlessly. Um, there's this big, big population of Marco sharks, highly migratory species like Marco's blues and turn of that just slosh around the ocean somehow and replenish fisheries all over the place. But when you start looking at um, their movements with satellite tags, you see quite a different picture. I had to qualify this by saying that all of the Marco we tagged were uh, juveniles only up to about two meters long. But what we found was they're making, they're, they're spending an awful lot of time within New Zealand, within New Zealand waters and much of it within territorial sea. So all of those gray dots there, they represent um, uh, uh, resident behavior. So Lots of that um, area, area um, searching, uh, area specific searching, but they make these um, long forays up into the Pacific, generally following uh, the, uh, the, gen the 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 ocean like the oceanic ridges to the north of New Zealand, like the Kermadec, um, the Norfolk, and the Lord Howe Rise. But they wouldn't spend much time up there, and um, they would turn around almost immediately and come back to New Zealand. So these sharks were spending um, well over 80% of their time within, within the New Zealand exclusive economic zone, much of that within the, um, within the territorial sea. And down in places like, even right down in places like Cook Strait, um, South Taranaki Bight, which we know is a great place for whales, uh, particularly blue whales, down off the um, west coast of the South Island, where it's a great place for hokey. So all these high productivity areas. And so what is the significance of return migration? Well, it's pretty, pretty obvious, really. Um, it means that you can't consider these animals, just the, the population of these animals to be um, amorphous. It has structure. The animals from one place, they are capable of remembering um, where they got their last, last good meal, um, and they will turn to those places um, regularly, and they, they spend a lot of time time in these places with great white sharks we saw the same sharks at Stewart Island almost every at least half the sharks almost every year for four or five years on on the trot this the white sharks are spending you know five to six months of every year in New Zealand waters so that creates an opportunity for conservation you know, it, people say why bother protecting them in New Zealand why um, they're just going to swim out of the you know, they're going to swim out of the New Zealand economic zone. They're going to be caught by um, people elsewhere. But what, what we see is that the, even though they're highly migratory, most of these species that have been studied are spending lots of time within national boundaries, and that makes it possible um, to, uh, to develop um, quite strong conservation measures for these animals. You know, they're traversing the high seas quite rapidly. So within national boundaries, you have the ability to um, bring in protective legislation and set catch limits. Um, and um, it hasn't been done in New Zealand yet, but it creates the possibility of establishing marine protected areas to protect critical habitats, such as pupping grounds or, 
or aggregation sites around seal colonies, for example, for, uh, that are important for uh, white sharks. And so I'll just finish with this slide of the latest species that we've started looking at um, uh, in collaboration with Mark Erdman from Conservation International. This is the oceanic manta ray. Again, this is another species that was thought to be simply vagrant in New Zealand, only turning up here in the summertime. Um, in 2009, taxonomy of manta rays was stood on its head and it was split into two, um, possibly three different species. It turned out that New Zealand was quite oddly was the only place in the southwestern Pacific that seemed to have a lot of sightings of um, oceanic manta rays everywhere else in the Pacific. Um, uh, and in Eastern Australia, the common manta ray there is a, is, is a different species called the reef manta ray. And so um, we started scratching our head and thinking, oh, maybe New Zealand's got its own population of manta rays. Maybe these aren't vagrants. Maybe they, they're spending a lot of time here. Maybe they're not even migrating um, elsewhere. So um, uh, we kicked off the, the first tagging um, of these of the species in 2019 off Northland. Um, we immediately started to notice things like there are pregnant females here. Um, and there people are people starting reported sightings and we, we there was mating. We, we had reports of mating um, occurring in New Zealand. Um, and so it certainly does look like we've got um, a population of uh, a resident population of manta rays here. Um, we have had some satellite re initial returns showing they do move up to places like Fiji and New Caledonia. In fact, the track, the animal that went to Fiji was the first confirmed occurrence of manta by uh, mobula biorostris in Fiji. Um, and so we're looking forward to what we can find out about this animal, um, these big gentle giants. And it turns out that the Haraki Gulf um, is, is, is a particular hot spot for these. And it's, as a, you've already heard, it takes a, a village to do any of this work. Um, so I'd just like to thank um, most the, fun, the funders of this work, particularly Department of Conservation and um, NIWA. Brilliant. Thank you, Clinton. Fabulous. Sorry about the start, rocky start. That's okay. You redeemed yourself. <laughs> yeah, sorry, everyone. Um, Sorry, it took a while to get that sorted. It is now question time. Uh, just before we go to question time, I would like to say I have it on good authority that there's been quite a few manta rays and even some devil rays hanging around the Poor Knights Islands in the last few days. Um, that's pretty cool. So questions. Uh, some similar questions from Adrian, Don and Leslie, uh, which are for you, Rochelle, uh, which is basically how do we know what the pre-whaling numbers were? you know, the people are expressing surprise at the exactness of the numbers. So where does all that data come from? And how do, how do we have such a good handle on how many whales there used to be? Rochelle. That's a good question. Um, the whalers were very good record takers. It was very important to them that they knew exactly what they were catching and returning. Um, when the International Whaling Commission came into place in the um, 1940s, they were the sort of global governing body regulating whaling. So there were conditions to reporting back the hunts and the, the takes that you had. And they'd learned um, from the very early whaling in the 1800s, in particular, the Southern right whaling, which was a, a complete disaster where no one really paid as good attention as they could. Um, and they sort of regulated them almost like fisheries and you know under fisheries law, like they were fish. So by the time commercial whaling was really at its prime in the sort of mainly the mid 1900s, there were records had to be kept um, and they had to be logged um, frequently. We had one exception, which was the, the Soviet Union at the time, which had two sets of books. Um, and it wasn't one of the big challenges we had, particularly in New Zealand, was working out why we had so few whales when we did all of our calculations compared to other places. Um, and it was because the Soviets had actually taken over 50,000 humpback whales in the 1959-60 and 60-61 season and had never reported them. But some of the whaling scientists did release that information finally, and that helped us 
So the calculations are done, um, it's statistics, it's modeling, it's understanding growth rates and uh, number of calves born and calving rates and all of those things that we usually use when we manage any stock or population of any animal. Uh, so yeah, there was some very good record taking. And I know certainly for the right whales, Emma did a, a, um, some very nice work with her colleagues um, a few years back and actually got hold of the old whaling log books, which were written in beautiful handwriting and had to be sort of translated to, to make sense. And so they were able to actually work out how many right whales, southern right whales were, were struck and killed and how many were struck and lost. And these, a certain proportion of those animals most certainly would have died without ever been taken. Yeah, so um, modeling is very important, yeah, uh, in, in us working out these numbers. And they are quite precise and, and we know that they're not too far off. Um, being correct, because the genetics also tells us that, as Emma explained, with those maternal lineages. Mm. Kapai, thank you. A question, a couple, again, a couple of similar questions, one from Eugenie, one from Jenny, which is, uh, what work has been done on whether sea, changing sea temperatures are affecting prey abundance for whales or sharks? And do we have any gauge on what cascading effects of, on, of climate change might have on the whales? Might go around the group, start with you, Rochelle. Um, we know that climate change uh, impacts in the Southern Ocean waters are not uniform. So in some areas, there's a, a massive loss of ice, which means there's likely to be uh, less krill in those places because it can't hole up in winter under the sea ice that expands out from the continent. Um, but in other places, there seems to be more sea ice. Uh, and so, yeah, the understanding that sort of those productivity levels is, is really tricky because it's not uniform throughout the Southern Ocean. That's part of the work that we're going to do with this tag data. We anticipate that there'll be less plankton, like um, krill production, because krill are their favourite, the humpback's favourite food. Uh, and with that, we suspect that perhaps the humpbacks will move their feeding grounds because they're actually capable of doing that. They, they're very good at storing energy. So if they have to swim a few extra thousand kilometres to get food, they may do. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very interesting question. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think we'll actually have some handle on it in the next sort of five to 10 years, much better handle with some of the remote sensing technologies. Um, so those are little, you know, all kinds of sensors in the ocean that can send us back information to help us understand the changing ocean. Thank you, Emma. Do you have anything to contribute from a Tohora point of view? Yeah, so Tohara and Southern Right Whales are viewed as a bit of a sentinel for climate change. They, uh, the um, amount of food or kai that the mum needs to uh, have these giant babies, you know, the babies are like four to six metres when they're born and they grow a metre a month. And so she really needs to eat a lot of kai and get in really good condition in order to be able to have that baby and help that baby survive. And so what we've been seeing in southern right whale populations around the world is that uh, there's been um, problems with reproduction. So calves are being born less often or calves are dying. And so that's why it's really important to understand where those whales are going to feed through these you know, satellite tracking studies, because then we can start to understand how changes in those regions of the ocean are impacting those reproduction um, and populations in those wintering grounds, which we can actually see. And the southern right whales are particularly challenging because as you saw from Wittemur's tracks, they can feed anywhere from 30 degrees south all the way to the ice edge. In some ways, humpbacks are so neat. You know, they show these, these nice directed movements and then they'll stay near the ice edge. Southern right whales are far more um, uh, disorganized, I guess. I don't know the right word for it. They, they, they're not as neat. Um, and so it's a much more of a challenge for us. And also because we, um, we've we seen such dramatic changes over time to understand where the Southern rights are going now and how that's impacting their recovery. Climate change and sharks, Clinton, any thoughts? Well, there hasn't been um, an awful lot of work done on um, that aspect of their bio biology. Um, Shark, well, Marcos and, and white sharks are sort of um, sort of in the thing. They're able to maintain, but certainly the adults are able to maintain a core body temperature between 24 and 26 degrees Celsius, which allows them to be active 
in um, very cold water and, and hunt very active prey. And the adults show these really broad environmental tolerances from we've, we've had sharks down on the Macquarie Ridge in a month, you know, swimming around at two, two and three degrees Celsius water. And a month later, they're swimming around off the Great Barrier with reef and 28 degrees Celsius water. But the work that's been done recently in California suggests that ju the juveniles aren't so tolerant um, of, uh, of temperature changes, and they've seen quite um, large shifts in the distribution of juvenile white sharks along the Californian coast in particular. And that's re resulting in a squeeze on habitat, um, juvenile habitat. So that's one potential way that they may be affected. Species like manta rays, um, basking sharks, and whale sharks, you know, the and devil rays, you know, the giant filter feeding um, species, that they are potentially um, be affected by shifts in the distribution of their prey. You know, and most of those species feed on krill. Um, devil rays feed quite heavily on um, on bait fish, small bait fish as well. Um, so shifts in their in, in their prey uh, could potentially result in big shifts in their distributions. And it's sort of telling, I think, that we no longer see basking sharks in coastal waters around New Zealand. In the right up until about the 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 late 1990s, uh, basking sharks, large schools of basking sharks were common around central and southern New Zealand, and they simply disappeared in the early 2000s and haven't been seen. And we don't think that the bycatch, the report said the estimated bycatch of that species in fisheries is enough to explain why they up and, have up and disappeared. It's interesting, there's a couple of things there. So basking sharks disappearing was a bycatch. So there's a risk to sharks from bycatch from fishing industries. Uh, we have a couple of questions, which are more from Eugenia Marin, wondering about the impact of commercial fishing practices on both sharks and whales in the sense of impacting their diet. So sticking with you, Clinton, with sharks, any, do we have any data to inform us about that? No, we, we don't really. We know um, we don't know enough about the diets of most of the shark species found in New Zealand. To even put them into a food web, the right place in a food web. Um, um, but we we do know that species like the great white shark, great whites, um, have incredibly broad diets. So they're um, they're quite flexible. Um, if it fits inside their mouth, they'll probably swallow it. And um, even some things that are bigger than them. They'll feed on like what they'll they regularly scavenge white whale carcasses, and so that's an important source of energy for them. Um, it is possible that changes in um, prey populations could affect them, but it seems less likely because of the breadth of their diet. Um, but some of the more specialised um, species might. What we've seen in other parts of the world, though, is where um, is is more um, the smaller sharks and rays being released. From predatory pressure by the big the big predatory sharks being fished down fished out um, so you've had population booms of things like um, eagle rays in the north pacific and the in the north atlantic and they've devastated beds of shellfish um, culturally and commercially important beds of shellfish and things like that just thinking of whales and commercial fishing rochelle and emma perhaps starting with emma uh, any evidence for the impact of commercial fishing practices on the whales? In terms of uh, southern right whales, there's not much evidence that the commercial fishing of krill has impacted their stocks. What's much more of a problem on a global scale with southern right whales, not so much in New Zealand because our tohara are down in the southern Arctic. Uh, is fishing gear entanglement and ship strike. So that's that's the danger for from fisheries for most big whales is actually getting caught up in gear and dragging that through the water, which creates a huge energetic demand on the whale. So they can, you know, if these might, whales are migrating 18,000 kilometers and they've got a cray pot wrapped around their tail, that's a real challenge. And so it's really about understanding where those interactions could occur, which they are quite rare in New Zealand, we're lucky, 
um, but trying to mitigate them through modification of fishing gear and things like that. Rochelle, any thoughts from you about commercial fishing and humpback whales? Mm, I think um, the humpbacks feed mostly when they're in the, the Southern Ocean. They do eat in a few spots on their migration path. But um, krill fishing in Antarctica in the Southern Ocean is something that's overseen by the CAMELA, the Convention on Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. And it's not a uniform um, uh, fishery. So, and there are some nations that do uh, catch more krill in certain areas. There are some areas very vulnerable, like the South Atlantic in particular. I don't think there should be um, any krill harvesting from down there. But, you know, south of, of New Zealand, I think, you know, thinking about, you know, the whales that pass through our waters, um, the krill fishery is relatively small compared to what they, what, what I think of greater concern will be those changes due to climate change. Um, and changes in temperature and productivity, sort of similar to what Clinton was, was talking about. Robert has a question about whale strandings, which actually makes me wonder, do humpbacks and southern right whales ever strand? And if we do, and then thinking of the bigger picture with whales, is stranding a natural process or do we think it's related in some ways sometimes to human activities? Um, I, I'll quickly answer that. We, we've never had, a, as far as we know, a stranded southern right whale, which is, is surprising given how close they come to shore and how huge they are. <laughs> you'd, you'd see one if you were walking on the beach. You'd probably smell it before you saw it, actually. Um, we do get strandings of the great whales. We have a number of you know, fin whale, blue whales, pygmy blue whales, occasionally humpback whales. We will get more of those strandings um, as the numbers increase. Uh, and that is part of the natural order of things in New Zealand. We have had some areas where um, strandings uh, have been caused by a vessel strike or entanglement in gear. And the Hauraki Gulf um, for the brooders whales in particular, that used to be a problem and now the ships have slowed, that's not such an issue anymore. Um, but we have, we do have whales come ashore uh, occasionally with um, boat propeller strike or um, broken traumatic injuries from, from a vessel strike of some kind. Also we have had whales entangled in gear as, as Emma was talking about and um, so but most of the whales that wash ashore, they, we don't know why they die. There are very few that have necropsies um, done, undertaken to find out the cause of death uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, but the vet team at Massey and Palmerston North have some amazing pathologists that when they can, they, they, they will have a look and um, see why the whale died. We don't have the large um, acoustic interference that occurs in other places, large scale military exercises on the scale that cause the mass strandings of different species. Um, and so some of the concerns that exist internationally are less of a concern in New Zealand. I think there's an issue with boat strike, particularly for the humpbacks migrating up the eastern coast of Australia, aren't there? Uh, a question for Clinton, which is what is the current legislation in New Zealand regarding catching sharks? Um, are Marco sharks a target species for international fishing boats that occur outside New Zealand territorial waters? That, and Rebecca wants to know, why is the fishing protection just for white sharks? So Clinton, can you be, briefly explain, explain to us what shark legal protection is at the moment for uh, in New Zealand? So there are a number of species that are protected under the Wildlife Act. So the first of those to be protected was the great white shark, but uh, basking shark, whale shark, um, small tooth sand tiger, which is a large deep water species, uh, oceanic manta rays and spine tail devil rays, uh, they're all protected, um, absolutely protected under the Wildlife Act. Um, anything that's not protected under the uh, Wildlife Act is managed under the Fisheries Act, um, and so they can be caught. Um, the species like Marco and Blue Shark, which are in the quota, and Poor Beagle Shark, they're in the, managed under the quota management system. Um, but there are a large number of other shark species that are, are not are managed under the quota management system. But generally, they're, just, they're taken as a non-target bycatch. And even even the main um, quota species of Marco, Paul Beagle and Blue Shark are not a target catch. They're a bycatch, mainly in the tuna fisheries. 
the uh, the ones that are target are rig and school shark, and that's what you get in your fish and chips. Lemon fish, eh? Uh, what else can we ask? There's lots of questions coming in, and I apologise in advance. We are not going to get to all of them. Uh, somebody wanted to know. Oh, eight-year-old William says, what can children do to help st the study of marine megafauna? It's a great question for all of you. What can the kids do? Do you want to take that away, Emma? Yeah, so uh, the Department of Conservation has an amazing sightings database. And so each time you see a, a whale or a dolphin, um, particularly the big whales, um, if you could take a photo from, you know, the 50 metre mark, because you're not supposed to get within 50 metres of a, of a whale, um, upload that photo to the DOC website. We really appreciate the citizen scientists contributing to our understanding of where the, the whales are, particularly these big migratory whales, um, that pop up every now and then, because they're still quite rare, the right whales around the mainland. So every sighting is really helpful. And I'd, I'd add to that as well, sites like iNaturalist, which is a really great citizen science initiative for all things you might find <laughs> in the sea, on the land, wherever. And another thing you can do is if, um, if you ever go for a walk on the beach or if there's, you know, you walk the dog regularly or somewhere where you go, just spend 10 minutes looking out to sea or, or 15 minutes, however long your patience can last. Just look out to sea and just look backwards and forwards and, and, and take note of what you see because sometimes you'll see a shark at the surface, sometimes you'll see whales, sometimes you'll see seabirds. So I think one of the most important things that we actually don't do very well anymore is stop and look. Just stop and look at the sea. And, um, and, and you know, pay attention. Also, if you can learn to snorkel and all kinds of things like that, it's, it's a really great way. Um, cheap little underwater cameras, great stuff. <laughs> and this holds for kids and adults. What about what people can do for shark research, Clinton? Uh, well, much the same as Rochelle. And uh, Emma have already explained the same goes for sharks as it does for whales. Um, uh, by all means, uh, if you catch a shark and you don't want to eat it, and it's you know, or it's a protected species, please let it go alive. <laughs> um, uh, it really, um, it's it's really quite concerning when you see people knock them on the head, a shark or or a stingray, because um, they view them as a pest species. They're important parts of the marine ecosystem, um, and um, and uh, you know they deserve every, they have every right to exist just as every other animal on the planet does. But Rochelle's point about learning to dive is a really good one because you, by diving, you really develop an understanding of the marine environment and and how everything fits together. And you learn to appreciate the animals, um, uh, plants and animals that live. Kapai, thank you, everyone. I should say that. Um, you've, you've said it, but I'll reinforce it, that actually photos are incredibly important because the whales and many of the sharks and the manta rays all have individual markings. So you can actually tell a lot from a photograph. You know, it's not just, a, oh, I saw something, but it may have been, I saw this individual, and that may be a very important part of the puzzle. I think that will bring our questions to a close. I have my eye on the time. Um, thank you for asking such great questions. Uh, they were terrific. I'm sorry we didn't quite get to all of them. A huge thank you to tonight's speakers, to Rochelle, to Emma and Clinton. Uh, thank you to you, our audience, for being here. And kia ora and thanks to Sarah working away behind the scenes to make this all happen. Now, if you can all take a moment to please fill out our survey. Uh, Sarah's just posted the link in the chat. Um, we would be really grateful. We will also send out a follow-up email, which will have this link, because we would love to hear what you thought about tonight's webinar so we can make the next ones even better. Now, don't forget, if you missed our previous webinars, they are online. You can find them via the Sea Week Facebook page. And tonight's webinar will be posted online as soon as we can. Uh, do share it around with your friends. Go back and have another listen. Uh, the next webinar is March the 31st, and it will shine a spotlight on the impact of plastics on a wide range of marine animals. 
So keep an eye out on the Sea Week Facebook for information about that. Um, you should be getting emails about that as well. Uh, and Sea Week itself does actually start. The physical Sea Week starts next week, March the 5th. Uh, there will be some local events, COVID permitting. Check out what's on in your area at the website, which is seaweek.org.nz. Before I go, I have another karakia with you. Ona here, ona here, ona here, kite uru tapu nui, kia watia, kia mama, te nako, te tinana, te wairua, te ara takata, koya rai rongo, faka ira aki ki ronga, kia tina, tina, huie takie. Draw on, draw on, draw on the supreme sacredness to clear to free the heart, the body, and the spirit of mankind, rongo, suspended high above us, draw together, affirm. Thanks for your company. Atamarie, good night. Stay safe and keep watching the sea. Take the time, watch the sea, see what you see. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.